indoors with players sweating and breathing all over each other as they travel around the country. And they're not starting from a great place. When teams started COVID testing to prepare for training camps, nearly 9% of players tested positive, a number that would be catastrophic if it continued throughout the season. So how do officials make sure it doesn't? Well, this weekend, the league dropped a 158-page memo detailing the new rules. That was an expansion on the 138-page memo they dropped last weekend. And here are some of the rules they talked about. Players and staff are no longer allowed to go to any bars, lounges, or clubs, even when they're at home and on their free time. No, quote, live entertainment either, Lou Williams, and no visits to public gyms, spas, pools. So it would seem that, say, if a player has a kid on a sports team and that team is playing this winter, the player cannot go to his kids' games. It'll be interesting to see how the league interprets that one. No indoor social gatherings that exceed 15 people either, so watch out for that Super Bowl party. And the rules get even more strict when teams are on the road. Players can't use the hotel gym, for example, unless the hotel has closed it to all other guests during the team's entire stay and sanitizes it between each use. There are rules for where and how players can eat, rules about mask wearing, testing, quarantining, and teams who break the rules intentionally or not, the NBA says it could levy fines, suspensions, or loss of draft picks. Games could be forfeited. Individual players could see their game checks docked. Uh Oh, and the league will also be doing unannounced spot inspections of team facilities to make sure they are in compliance too. So is all of this going to work? Yes and no. The NBA has so far been the most thoughtful sports league in America when it comes to COVID, from the experts they're working with to the protocols that they have put in place. Uh, But this is a virus that has a Rashid Wallace-like disregard for officiating. And no matter how many rules there are, the positive tests are going to come. The games will be disrupted. So no, Toto, we're not in the bubble anymore. There are no ruby slippers to click together. Just a lot of patience and a lot of cross fingers as what could be the NBA's most chaotic season is set to begin. Coach Fizz, this is a lot, a lot. As a coach, if you were in the position of trying to manage players dealing with all this, how enforceable even are all these rules? Well, I think you have to have those rules in place. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're trying to pull off something that's, that's nearly impossible. Uh, so you do have to have those things in place, but you just really would hope that people would take this seriously enough that they wouldn't put themselves in those positions to jeopardize not only their health and other people's health and lives, but your profession, your craft. Uh, a lot of people are going to suffer just because of irresponsible decisions. I think that's going to be where it comes down to is the personal responsibility of everyone doing their job to make sure that everyone stays safe. The same thing we've been asking the whole country to do, right? But I think the next step is gonna be, what is the NBA gonna do when a guy gets sick? How are they gonna handle that? And then how are they gonna track that and keep the league moving forward as they try to get 72 games accomplished? I think all of that stuff uh, uh, is gonna be something that the league is gonna have to figure out as they go. But I do think having a strict uh, uh, situation in place to start is the way to go and then you can always adjust from there you know rach i think this is going to come down to players keeping each other accountable um this is what it's happened what's what's happened in every other sport i remember when baseball started up and the marlins had a big outbreak and there were several other teams that had that were disrupted by it and it almost looked like baseball wasn't going to get off the ground and uh, you know, I think the, the the tipping point was really the Cleveland Indian situation right. when you had Mike Clevenger and and, yep. and the other pitcher go out, um, and their teammates really called them out. And I remember talking to Kenley Jansen from the Dodgers at the time, and he said, you know, if we want to have a season, if we want to do any of this, like we've got to keep ourselves accountable. And I think, you know, I've heard about the we we made fun of the snitch line, okay, in, in Orlando. <laughs> um, it wasn't this as necessary back, right? in Orlando, right. but it is very necessary. <laughs> <laughs> going forward, right? right? That snitch line is going to be really important, and it's got to be coming from within. Because if the league has to crack down on teams, um, if the league has to make an example of somebody, kind of like they did with Lou Williams, I thought in the bubble they made an mm-hmm. example of him. Um, we saw that in football with the Denver Broncos, they may try to make an example of those quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. But th- that that's only going to be putting out spot fires. If you actually want this to work, it has to come from the players. It's complicated. Yeah. How important though. is it to you at the end of the day? Right, but yeah. it's complicated, guys, right? Because on the teams that are marching toward a championship, 
I, I can see players holding each other accountable. We all know what it's like in the yeah. middle of the season with a team that maybe doesn't feel like it's really in there and not everybody's rowing in the same direction. And by the way, that Cleveland Indians example, Ramona, is exactly right. And that's the thing I think of the most also. But it is different in baseball where you have a whole rotation of pitchers and even some of the most important players can't not necessarily be replaced but aren't as vital every day. James Harden, we just talked about in the last segment, yep. was out in a club in a city he wasn't, according to the NBA, supposed to be in, being with people he wasn't supposed to be with, not wearing a face mask. And I don't know how things are going to feel like in the locker room when he does finally rejoin that team. But can the Rockets go out and do what they want to do this season without James Harden or whoever they trade him for to fulfill that role? No, they can't. So how much are other players in that locker room going to, quote, hold James Harden accountable? It is a very, very complicated stew. And it's just a lot of rules also. And Ramona, I haven't gotten a great answer on with a positive test. As Fizz says, we read the protocols and the 10-day quarantine and the two negative tests to come yep. back and all of that. But what have you heard about how the schedule is going to change? Because if someone comes with a positive test on a Monday, even if he is isolated immediately, yep. what are they going to do about the team that he played on Saturday night or Sunday afternoon and the two teams that that team is supposed to play the following next day or the day after that when they try to get three or four games a week? Yeah, I mean, that's that's going to be the big question going forward, because, you know, in the NFL, you can isolate close contacts and you have all week to do it. You have to you have the benefit of time in the NBA. You don't have that. And they've tried to mitigate this a little bit by having more of a baseball schedule where you have sort of two games back to back. So theoretically, it would only be one team that you played. So you're not going to have the every night a new team that right. we're worried about. Yep. But I just think back on that night when Rudy Gobert tested positive March 11th, where we, you know, somebody put this graphic up on Twitter of like how many teams the, the Jazz had played in the last 14 days and how many teams those teams had played in the last 14 days. And it was basically the whole league. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a house of cards. And, you know, if you think about the way that the nature of how this is structured. Now, I'll, I'll tell you this. I know one team that has been dealing with this and because of HIPAA laws, um, you know, I can't say which player it is. Sure. Um, but. The this team, you know, there's there was a, a player that tested positive that had like practiced with some teammates and they've kind of been sweating it out this week to see if any more of them, um, you know, this is away from the away from the court, but they sweating it out to see if any more of them test positive. Turns out they're they're all OK. Everybody was fine. Um, but they're what the NBA is hoping is that this little onboarding process is what's going to get all the positive tests and you're not going to see, you know, 9% again. Like they're hoping they got their 9% out of the way. Yeah, absolutely. Mm, and we, we still don't know really, the medical community doesn't know enough concretely about the reinfection rate and whether and how long you have immunity, autoimmunity from right. that. So we don't know if, quote, getting out of the way means that a lot of those players just won't get it throughout this season or if someone can be reinfected. We will discover that as we go. All right, guys, coming up, let's get back to the basketball